Listener discretion is advised. True crime can be strangely fascinating. This true crime is odd, macabre, and haunted. I'm Diane, your guide into the shadows. Welcome to Phantasmal Crime. Each of us six officers had a shotgun and an automatic rifle and pistols. We opened fire with the automatic rifles. They were empty before the car got even with us. Then we used shotguns. There was smoke coming from the car, and it looked like it was on fire. After shooting the shotguns, we emptied the pistols at the car, which had passed us and ran into a ditch about 50 yards on down the road. It almost turned over. We kept shooting at the car even after it stopped. We weren't taking any chances. Thus ended the crime spree and the lives of the infamous lovers, Bonnie and Clyde. And yet, that wasn't their end. Rumors claim their spirits live on in the afterlife. At the end of her life, Bonnie Parker was a pistol-wielding, cigar-chomping bank robber. But she certainly didn't start out that way. Bonnie Parker was born to a poor family on October 1, 1910, in Rowena, Texas. Her father was a bricklayer and died when Bonnie was only four years old. This left her mother to care for Bonnie and her older brother and younger sister on her own. So she moved the family to Cement City in West Dallas to be closer to Bonnie's grandparents. Bonnie was beautiful and an honor student in school with dreams of becoming an actress. When she was 15, she met her first bad boy, Roy Thornton, and the two were soon married. Roy was a thief, and he beat Bonnie. Three years after they were married, Roy was arrested and sentenced to five years in prison, and Bonnie took her chance to get away. She moved in with her grandmother. The couple never officially divorced, but Bonnie never saw Roy again. She met Clyde Barrow in January of 1930. Clyde Barrow was born into a poor family as well. On March 24, 1909, in Teleco, Texas. The family were farmers, but drought forced them to move. Clyde had dreamed of being a musician when he was a kid, and he knew how to play the saxophone and guitar, but that would not be his future. He started his life of stealing when he was a young child. An older brother showed him the ropes, starting with stealing little things and moving up to cars. Finally, Clyde moved into armed robbery, and by the time he was 20, he was a wanted fugitive. Imagine for a moment that when Bonnie and Clyde met each other in 1930, they were performing somewhere together, on stage, and moved on to lives of fame and entertainment, rather than infamy. How very different things would have been for them. Hollywood has tended to romanticize the lives and crimes of Bonnie and Clyde, but they committed heinous acts and lived by the gun. And that is how they would die. When Clyde met Bonnie, she was 19 and working as a waitress. The two were immediately smitten with each other. But things halted when Clyde was sent to prison. Bonnie wasn't keen on a life of crime at first. After Clyde was jailed, she begged him to straighten out his life. As we know, he certainly didn't agree to that. And soon, she smuggled in a gun, and Clyde broke out. He was captured a month later after a robbery and was sentenced to 14 years in Ohio's Easton Prison Farm. This was a harsh place, and the work was tough and Clyde couldn't handle it anymore. He devised a plan to get a transfer. He figured he would need to be disabled in some way, and he chose to chop off two of his toes to create that disability. He was set to be released in six days anyway in February of 1932, so it was unnecessary. He was crippled the rest of his life with a staggered gait, and he could not wear shoes when driving. Bonnie became crippled herself in 1933 when the couple were in an accident that busted the car battery. The battery acid spilled out onto Bonnie's leg, giving her third-degree burns and burning her all the way to the bone in places. She walked with a pronounced limp and needed to be carried at times. The couple dreamed of a carefree criminal life and formed a gang they called the Borrow Gang. Bonnie and Clyde gained notoriety mostly as bank robbers, but their specialty was small, petty crime like holding up mom-and-pop gas stations. 
They usually only got away with 5 to $10. They also robbed several armories, which is why they were able to collect so many guns. In March of 1932, the couple had a failed robbery attempt in Kaufman, Texas, and Bonnie was arrested, but she would be released on June 17, 1932. While she was in jail, Clyde murdered merchant J.W. Butcher. The couple was on the run after Bonnie was freed, but hey, why not take a break for a little dance? And that's just what they did in Atoka, Oklahoma. They were reported, and the police attempted to apprehend them in the parking lot. They killed two police officers and got away. Murder was becoming a part of their normal routine now. They traveled through Missouri, New Mexico, Texas, and Oklahoma, killing another police officer and a grocery store clerk. On April 13, 1933, the Barrow Gang, consisting of Bonnie, Clyde, his brother Buck, and Buck's wife Blanche, and a man named William Daniel Jones, who went by W.D., was holed up in an apartment in Joplin, Missouri. The local police had been raiding joints they heard were running bootlegging operations. Beer was legal at this time, but not other spirits. They had word of illegal activity coming out of this apartment, and they busted down the door, surprising the gang. A firefight ensued, with W.D. getting hit with a bullet in his side. The Barrow gang killed two of the police officers and escaped. They left behind everything except their guns and the clothes on their backs. The infamous pictures of Bonnie and Clyde posing with guns around a stolen car were confiscated by the police and released to the local newspaper. This made Bonnie and Clyde famous, and now the whole nation was on the lookout for the gang. The crime spree continued until July 1933 when another shootout with police occurred. The gang consisted of five members and they were about to be down one as Buck had been mortally wounded. Captain William Baxter of the Missouri Highway Patrol had hit Buck in the forehead with a bullet, exposing his brain and causing severe loss of blood. But he was still alive and still shooting so that Clyde could get away. Blanche was wounded in this same gunfight. The entire gang was able to escape. And despite his ghastly head wound and loss of blood, Buck was sometimes fully conscious and was able to talk and eat. There was another shootout five days later, and this time Buck got hit six times in the back. So you're probably thinking, he's dead now, but he wasn't. He was still alive, but he and Blanche were captured. He was taken to the hospital, he survived surgery, and they thought maybe he might survive his wounds until he got pneumonia, and that's what actually took him out. So he was initially shot in the head but he's going to die of pneumonia. In January 1934, Clyde decided to help break some inmates out of the Easton prison, and a prison guard was killed during the jailbreak. An inmate named Henry Methvin joined the Barrow Gang, and the robberies continued. The two men killed two highway patrolmen on April 1, 1934, and then Methvin killed a constable a few days later. The public had enough of this, and the law in Texas set out to put an end to the Barrow Gang. Methvin took Bonnie and Clyde to his family home in Louisiana, but Methvin's father contacted the police and gave them Bonnie and Clyde in exchange for amnesty for his son. Texas Ranger Captain Frank Hammer gathered a posse and went to get the couple. It was an ambush that Bonnie and Clyde had no idea was coming. The date was May 23, 1934. Bonnie and Clyde were returning to the house after picking up some sandwiches when they saw Methvin's father on the side of the road with a car that appeared broken down. They stopped to help him, and Hammer and his men opened fire. The five men emptied multiple guns into the stolen Ford V8 the couple was driving, firing over 130 bullets. Both were killed. Clyde had been hit by 17 bullets, although the first bullet that hit him in the head killed him instantly, and Bonnie was hit by 26. Each shot was a fatal wound. The car was towed to town with the dead couple still inside. Gawkers tried to take souvenirs, and some actually did manage to get locks of hair and pieces of clothing. One man tried to cut off Clyde's ear and trigger finger. The couple were buried in separate cemeteries, but this was not the end of the gangster couple. Their spirits seemed to continue on in the afterlife. A marker now stands on the spot along Highway 54 in Louisiana where Bonnie and Clyde's crime spree was brought to a final end. The marker seems to be a magnet of sorts for their spirits. People who try to take a picture of the marker claim to capture weird anomalies and ghostly figures. EVPs have been captured at the location that are both male and female and incorporate pieces of Bonnie and Clyde's names. 
Disembodied chatting, screaming, and laughing have been heard. There's also the sound of gunfire. Southern Sinister Paranormal investigated the ambush site in 2020, and they claimed to capture nine EVPs. They also used a spirit box, but it was really hard to hear. They did ask, what happened here? And about 30 seconds later, a clearly female voice said what sounded like, police, but could have been please. I couldn't differentiate between the two, so either one of those was a possibility for me. Police would make sense to be an answer to that question. It was clearly a female voice. Then they asked, did they shoot you? And again, a very clear female voice responded, but I couldn't make out what she was saying. I did hear a distant scream on the video as well. There's also the sound of footsteps on the gravel. And I have to trust that they weren't making those sounds, but the two investigators I was listening to both heard them audibly and seemed a bit shaken by it. The blood-splattered, bullet-ridden death car became an instant attraction and went on a tour for 30 years. The car could be seen at flea markets, amusement parks, carnivals, and state fairs. After that, it was acquired by the Museum of Antique Autos in Princeton, Massachusetts. The car turned up in the 1970s at a Nevada racetrack. People were charged a dollar to sit in it. In the 1980s, it was in a Las Vegas car museum, which is where I actually saw it back in the day. It then moved to a different casino on the other side of the freeway and then did another tour through the early 2000s. The death car can now be seen on display at Whiskey Pete's Casino, part of the Prim Valley Resorts in Prim, Nevada. Clyde's bullet-shredded shirt is also on display there, although time has faded out the bloodstains. This is reputed to be a haunted vehicle. Standing near the car gives one a very creepy feeling, and photographs of the car feature weird anomalies. One of the locations that we've covered on the podcast is the Baker Hotel in Mineral Wells, Texas. Rumors claim that Bonnie and Clyde stayed at this hotel under assumed names back early on in their criminal careers. And now people claim that they may be here after their deaths. They've either returned here because they enjoyed their stay or because the hotel once showcased items from the couple, including a love poem Bonnie wrote to Clyde, her 38 revolver, and photographs of the couple. There are claims that their spirits prefer two areas, the Brazos room and the ballroom. A ghostly woman in a dated dress has been seen in the lobby walking between the pillars. And the spirits of the couple have been seen dancing in the ballroom, and people do claim to hear their laughter. Another haunted location connected to the couple is a former deli in Gibsland, where they bought their last meal of sandwiches. That deli is now a museum dedicated to them, and is said to be haunted by the woman who had sold them the sandwiches. They say she stays because of her remorse about selling them those sandwiches. The spirits of Bonnie and Clyde have also been seen at the museum. The apartment in Joplin is reportedly haunted as well, although some believe that the two dead officers may be the ghosts here rather than Bonnie and Clyde. Username M. Morbid commented on YouTube, I ran into an investigator this year at the Bonnie and Clyde Festival. They investigate it every year the evening of the festival, and Clyde communicates with them intelligently through EVP and Spirit Box regularly. My favorite response they told me about was when they asked if they wished they'd been able to live a long life. A male voice replied, Blanche is dead, basically indicating, sure, she lived a long life, but in the end, you die anyway, no matter how long you get. If it's really him, he doesn't seem to have any regrets. And in 2020, Zach Bagans of Ghost Adventures purchased the tackle box that the Barrow gang used to keep themselves fed while on the run, and it is on display at his haunted museum in Las Vegas. As to whether they've ever gotten any activity from it, I don't know. It might be just there for morbid curiosity. Another interesting thing is that Bonnie almost seemed to have a premonition about what would happen to them. Although if you live the life of crime that they did, you probably expect that you're going to come to a bad end. She wrote this poem, The Story of Bonnie and Clyde, in 1934. You've read the story of Jesse James, of how he lived and died. If you're still in need of something to read, here's the story of Bonnie and Clyde. Now, Bonnie and Clyde are the Barrow gang. I'm sure you all have read how they rob and steal and those who squeal are usually found dying or dead. There's lots of untruths to these write-ups. They're not so ruthless as that. Their nature is raw. They hate all the law, the stool pigeons, spotters, and rats. They call them cold-blooded killers. They say they are heartless and mean. But I say this with pride that I once knew Clyde when he was honest and upright and clean. But the laws fooled around, kept taking him down and locking him up in a cell till he said to me, I'll never be free. 
so I'll meet a few of them in hell. The road was so dimly lighted, there were no highway signs to guide, but they made up their minds if all roads were blind, they wouldn't give up till they died. The road gets dimmer and dimmer, sometimes you can hardly see, but it's fight, man to man, and do all you can, for they know they can never be free. From heartbreak some people have suffered, from weariness some people have died, but take it all in all, our troubles are small, till we get like Bonnie and Clyde. If a policeman is killed in Dallas, and they have no clue or guide, if they can't find a fiend, they just wipe their slate clean and hand it on Bonnie and Clyde. There's two crimes committed in America, not accredited to the Barrow Gang. They had no hand in the kidnap demand, nor the Kansas City Depot job. A newsboy once said to his buddy, I wish old Clyde would get jumped. In these awful hard times, we'd make a few dimes if five or six cops would get bumped. The police haven't got the report yet, but Clyde called me up today. He said, don't start any fights. We aren't working nights. We're joining the NRA. From Irving to West Dallas Viaduct is known as the Great Divide, where the women are kin and the men are men, and they won't stool on Bonnie and Clyde. If they try to act like citizens and rent them a nice little flat, about the third night, they're invited to fight by a subgun's rat-tat-tat. They don't think they're too tough or desperate. They know that the law always wins. They've been shot at before, but they do not ignore that death is the wages of sin. Someday they'll go down together, and they'll bury them side by side. To few it'll be grief, to the law relief, but it's death for Bonnie and Clyde. And it indeed was. The only thing she got wrong there, they didn't bury them side by side. Is that why they may be at unrest? Do the spirits of Bonnie and Clyde haunt the places where they spent some of their time? Particularly the place where their lives came to an end? That is for you to decide. Thanks so much for listening to History Ghost Bumps, Phantasmal Crime. If you'd like to share with us a haunted crime that you've heard about, please write us at historyghostbump at gmail.com. I've been your host, Diane. Join me on the next episode for another trip through the shadows. This has been a production of History Goes Bump Podcast.